guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. Have you ever been thrilled by a piece of music or amazed by a mathematical proof or appalled at injustice or touched by sacrificial love? Have you ever wondered why we, alone among all God's creatures, have this tremendous capacity for self-transcendence, to transcend our merely animal existence? Well, Catholic faith teaches us that these capacities have been placed into us by God. They're what it means to be created in the image of God. And they're clues that point beyond our merely material existence to our ultimate origin and destiny in God. This is why man is a religious being, why we have this unconsolable longing for we know not what. You know, St. Augustine said that our hearts are restless and can only find their rest in God. He made us for Himself so that we might reach out to Him and perhaps find Him. Made in the image of God, this is why man is a religious being. How can we come to know God? If we have this innate desire for God, this longing for the transcendent that stands at the root of all the world's religions, does that mean that any religion, any conception of God will do? There's a common attitude, I think, that sees faith as a kind of leap in the dark, picking whatever seems attractive or sublime to me. Whatever seems to speak to this universal longing would have an equal claim for acceptance. But this is not the Catholic view. It's not even a reasonable view, since it commits you to believing things that, in principle, cannot be known to be true. The Catholic position, and the only reasonable view, is that we should only believe what we can know to be true. And the first principles of faith, the existence of the one God, His providence, can in fact be known with certainty and clarity from the light of human reason. How can reason tell us about God? There's something I've always found fascinating about St. Paul's sermon to the Athenians. 
For St. Paul, uh, God is a bit of a tease, throwing out just enough to let us know that there's something there, a first cause, a principle, an origin of all things, but not much about who or what that first cause is, whetting our appetite for more, for something far better and far more sublime, vastly more satisfying that comes only by grace. But how can reason tell us even this much, that there is a God? Well, Catholic philosophy begins with human experience and reasons backwards to the ultimate source of that experience. So, for example, we perceive that some things are changed by other things. We pursue that line until we arrive at something that's causing change but is unchanged itself, and this we call God. Or one thing causes another thing to be, to exist. Does this cause exist of itself, or is it caused by something else? Eventually, we arrive at something that exists of itself, necessarily, but which causes the being of all else. Or consider our sense of moral goodness, that is to say our conscience, our conviction that moral norms exist. Well, these demand a transcendent point of reference, and this we call God. How can we speak about God? We speak about God as a reality, something, someone who is there, not as mere wish fulfillment or metaphor, something knowable by reason before faith enters in at all. So the Catholic who speaks about God is not just talking about his own private experience, but about something objective. And our reasons for faith can be shared with the philosopher, the scientist, and even the man of no faith at all. There's a very well-known atheist philosopher, Anthony Flew, who spent his life attacking religious belief. But towards the end of his life, he took a fresh look at the classical arguments for the existence of God. And after a lifetime of atheism, he came not to religious belief, but to a philosophical conviction that God exists. Flew's story is instructive, I think, in illustrating the limits of our knowledge from reason. As a strict philosopher, someone committed only to what could be known by reason, Flew didn't come to Catholic faith, which includes many things that we cannot know by reason, but have to know from revelation, above and beyond reason. So what we can say of God in himself is limited uh, and requires us to guard against overstatement. There's still room for mystery and, quite frankly, for unbelief. When sinful man considers only or primarily the limits in our knowledge of God, it becomes all too easy to rationalize rejecting him. If man is to answer the questions he cannot avoid asking himself about the meaning and purpose of life, he has to experience the definitive love of God. God must come to us for us to experience this love. We cannot learn it from books. We cannot learn it from other things like that because it's not information. It's a person. Prior to Jesus Christ coming, God gave us covenants, and the covenants was his way of gradually revealing himself to us because by nature and uh, other things of the cosmos, we cannot know the definitive love of God, the eternal love of God, which is a kind of love, the kind of love for which man's heart was made.
God reveals himself to us, that's what we cannot know by looking at cells or leaves or stars. God must reveal himself to us because who can mount the heavens and see God? Who has defined his shape, his form? Only God can make himself known to us. And the Catechism calls this divine realities. That's what we need, the divine realities. In this section of the Catechism, it tells us that it asks about the first covenant with Noah. But prior to that, it mentions that God buoyed up our first parents by giving them hope for a savior. But with Noah, we have the word covenant. And the covenant with Noah revealed something about God that destruction of the flood or the confusing of their languages at Babel did not do. It did not tell you that God is eternal love. When God comes to Noah, and he says, I will not, I swear by myself, destroy the world again with a flood. This is something about God that we did not know by the flood or by the confusion of languages at Babel. What did we learn? We learned that God, God chose, he wants the sinner to live, not die. This is what he's revealing about himself. This, this thing, this person he is called eternal love. And that's what the covenant with Noah tells us, that the other acts that, sur that are on either side of it do not, that God is eternal love. This is the beginning of the revelation of himself. After Noah, the covenant with Noah, there's a covenant with Abraham. And uh, Abraham experienced the voice of God a number of times. But there's this significant place in scripture where God comes to him as, a, as a, something of fire with smoke coming from it, and he and Abraham walk through the parts of the animals that Abraham has laid out. Abraham experiences God in the uh, shepherds who come, come to him. The shepherds are actually angels, right? And the visitors, they come to him. And in this, he begins to experience God himself as the eternal love that he is. This is the covenant by which the Jews mark their beginning, the covenant with Abraham, which comes after Noah. But the Catechism tells us uh, real briefly, he goes over, uh, goes over Moses and God forming his people by the Mosaic Covenant, but then it keys in on the definitive covenant of Jesus Christ, where I am made aware by contact with Jesus Christ. Think of the first disciples. They are in the presence of God as man. I, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, in the presence of God in a Eucharistic way, who has become man. I must experience the definitive love of God, and I can only do that when God comes to me, and that's what he did in Jesus Christ. Well, if God comes to you so that you can look him in the face and you can touch his hands, there's no more of God to give you. If God comes in his complete self, then to look for more beyond that is 
silly. And it's silly to look beyond Jesus Christ, who is complete God, full, fully, through and through God. Fully God and fully man, we say. Because we have experienced in Jesus Christ the eternal love of God that we need for our heart. How is divine revelation transmitted? Christ entrusted his definitive revelation to the church. It's very important to realize that uh, Christ did not hand us a book. He, he handed us a church. In Matthew 28, we learn that Christ commissioned the apostles and he said, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. Uh, this revelation that he handed over to them included unwritten traditions, uh, the most important of which is the liturgy. Think about St. Paul when he passes on the definitive revelation to the church in Corinth in chapter 11 of his first epistle. He says, I hand on to you what I received from Christ that on the night he was betrayed took bread and so on and so forth. So it's the church that hands on this saving mystery of Christ. First in the apostles, uh, in their ordination and uh, their successors, the bishops, that they ordained to carry the message after them. Um, in the traditions of the church, most importantly, the liturgy and the sacraments. These are a bearer of the saving mystery of Christ. In the life and ministry of the faithful who receive the faith from the church, accept it, live it, breathe it, and hand it on to their children. And then, of course, we must not forget also those things that the apostles committed to writing, the sacred scriptures, which are a part of the church's tradition and a very important but not the only means of carrying on this saving mystery of Jesus. So our question is, what is tradition? And I love this question because our tradition is so important to us in our Catholic faith. Um, I think that it's always good to start with the word itself, to understand. Tradition, in English, comes to us from a Latin root word which is trado, tradere, to hand down or to hand on. And we know that Jesus first handed on his teachings orally to the apostles. Those men that were gathered around him and they learned from him everything that he had to say and they witnessed his actions. They had such a depth of experience, the three years that they spent with him traveling throughout Judea and Galilee. In our faith, this is a key point because the scriptures even point to the fact that there were many things that Jesus said and did which are not recorded in the scriptures. This is to be found in the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter at the 25th verse. So these apostolic witnesses, they're privileged in a wonderful way. And so today we consider what they received and then what they handed on in turn to our bishops, the successors of the apostles, to be our tradition in the faith. The apostolic succession, too, helps us understand the unbroken way this tradition has been handed on to us. We have the oral tradition handed down. And then we also have the written tradition that's been handed down, the fathers of the church, all sorts of things, all sorts of resources and great and wonderful gifts that we've received in our faith. When we talk about the word tradition, I think it's important to make a distinction between tradition with a big T and tradition with a little t. In the church, we talk about tradition with a big T. It's a very specific thing. It refers to what I mentioned before about how Christ's teachings have been handed on in this special and wonderful way, guided by the Holy Spirit to the successors of the apostles. Tradition with a little t, we speak of commonly, that's kind of like having turkey at Thanksgiving. You know, it's traditional for us to have turkey at Thanksgiving. But we could have a duck or a goose, even a vegetarian alternative on our Thanksgiving Day meal. But those are traditions that are with a little t. They're not exactly the same as the tradition of our faith, which has been given to us in this wonderful way. 
What is the relationship between tradition and sacred scripture? Well, first of all, what do we mean by tradition? The Catechism speaks of tradition as the, the, the living transmission of the faith by the church. So in a sense, tradition is simply everything that the church has and does to pass on the heritage of the faith, including the writings of the fathers, the pronouncements of popes and councils, um, and of course, the, uh, the writings of the apostles and the scriptures themselves. So in one sense, scripture is part of the tradition of the church. Uh, it's important to remember, I think, that we wouldn't even have the Bible, we wouldn't have the scriptures apart from the tradition of the church telling us which books are to be considered inspired, which are to be received and read in the churches. Um, so the Catechism speaks about scripture and tradition as flowing from one source, one definitive revelation, scripture and tradition together. The tradition and the scripture have a beautiful relationship together. They I always like to say they're like two wings of the same dove. The dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, always. We see that in that beautiful um, image in St. Peter's Basilica, that beautiful window behind the altar of the chair, the Holy Spirit that guides the whole life of our church, our spiritual life. That same Holy Spirit, that dove, has two wings. One is the scripture and one is the apostolic tradition, the tradition with a big T. The dove flies when both wings are exercised. If only one wing were there, it would fly around in a circle. But we have these two wings which help the dove of the Holy Spirit to keep uh, watch over the whole church, our whole lives in Christ. And let us go back now to the time preceding the final journey of Jesus to Jerusalem, to his death. He was with his disciples at Bethsaida. Since he left Nazareth, he had been living at the home of St. Peter and St. Andrew, two brothers. That was his postal address. So they were all gathered at Bethsaida, and Jesus had one final task to perform. He walked them the whole way up the River Jordan, about 30 miles northwards, then veered off to the east, northeast, to a city called Caesarea Philippi. It was called Philippi because it was embellished by the emperor, by the, no, the tetrarch, the tetrarch uh, Philip, who was the son of, of Herod the Great by one of his many wives. So Jesus had chosen, had chosen this particular scenario. He had chosen this, so we call it dramatic backdrop for the work he was going to do now. There in Caesarea Philippi, there's a great outcrop of rock. It was 100 feet wide and 40 feet high. On top of it is the, are the ruins of an old temple to, to Pan, the god Pan. And at the bottom of the rock, there is an opening where the people threw in gifts to the gods of the netherworld. So with Peter standing there against the backdrop of this outcrop of rock, Jesus said to him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, Jesus was speaking in Aramaic, and what he said was, Thou art rock. Thou art rock, 
and on this rock I'll build my church. I have spoken to a, a scholar of Aramaic, and he told me two interesting details. First of all, this is the only text in Aramaic where the word kepha, rock, is used as a personal noun. Secondly, the word kepha used in this text is preceded by the definite article. So therefore Christ was saying to Peter, thou art the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Thou art the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. This is the first metaphor in, by which uh, Jesus promises to confer upon Peter the authority over the church. Now let me explain the, the metaphor. Uh, Peter is to be the rock foundation of the church. What is the relationship of the foundation to the building which is built thereon? It, it, the foundation is a principle of unity, the principle of stability, the principle of cohesion. And in a society, what is the principle of cohesion, stability, and unity? Authority. So therefore, by this metaphor, Jesus is giving to Peter authority, authority over the church which he's building on him. Now the second metaphor in verse 19 is, I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Note that in these two texts he is speaking in the singular to Peter alone. I'll give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The apostles immediately thought of Isaiah 22, verse 22. There we have the story of Shebna, who was the major domo of the king's palace, Hezekiah's palace, and uh, he, when he got to, to, too big for his boots, shall we say, and he built a tomb for himself in the rock. And the king didn't like this. Incidentally, later in the last century, uh, the remains of Shebna's um, tomb have been found. So anyway, he was deprived of his position as major domo. And the keys, the key, the key, the large key was placed on the shoulder of Eliakim, who was a new major domo. So, of course, the apostles would have been familiar with that. And Jesus therefore says to him, I'll give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The key of the major domo was the symbol of authority. He opened the door in the morning, he closed the door at night. He admitted and he kept people from going in and going out. That was the symbol of authority. So likewise, the keys now conferred upon Peter are likewise the symbol of authority. These two metaphors symbolize authority. How is the heritage of the faith interpreted? Very early on in the history of the Christian tradition, there was a principle understood that if something dated from the days of the apostles and could be found universally throughout the Christian world, that this was a very important witness to authentic Christian faith. Uh, an early church father, St. Vincent of Laren, once said that the true Catholic faith is that which has been held always, everywhere, and by all. And that remains an important principle of interpretation and authority for understanding the Catholic faith. But sometimes more specificity is needed. A controversy arises and the church has need of a definitive pronouncement. And in those instances, 
uh, she recognizes the authority that Christ gave to the apostles uh, to define these things. When Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And we see this pattern repeated over and over again in the history of the church. Again in scripture in the book of Acts chapter 15, uh, all the bishops of the church met in council to de decide a matter of controversy and they said it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us to define these issues. When the church does this, when she issues a, a definitive pronouncement, uh, it, it establishes what's called a dogma. Uh, the catechism speaks of dogmas as lights along the path uh, to illumine our life in God, help us come to know Him better. It's possible for faith to develop because as questions arise and controversies arise um, and definitions are made and lines are drawn, uh, we see that we can grow in a greater and greater understanding of the content of the faith and its significance for our lives. One of the beautiful things about our faith is that this question of interpretation, um, we have so much help in this regard. Our faith has something we call the magisterium. And again, it's important to kind of go back to the root word there. Magister in Latin is the teacher. And the magisterium is the teaching office of our church. Uh, a couple of important things to understand about that is that the teaching office of the church is at the service of the deposit of faith. The sacred scriptures and the apostolic tradition have been given to us by God. And now the church, they've been entrusted to the church. And the church's teaching office is the servant of what it's been given. So to help us have access more than anything to this divine revelation and to understand it in union with all the other believers in the Catholic faith in the world, this teaching office is exercised by the bishops. Uh, who are the successors of the apostles. The bishops in union with the see of Peter, with the successor of Peter, who's the Pope. This unity, this great agreement on the matters of faith and doctrine, this is what is the teaching office of our church. It helps us to understand with the fullness and the full light of the Holy Spirit exactly what God means to reveal to His people in the past, in the present, and for our salvation. Sacred Scripture, above all, is the Word of God. And this concept of the Word is uh, a deep concept that runs really throughout Catholic theology. In Hebrew, the word for word is dabar. And we know that in Genesis, when God speaks a word, things come into being. So the word is the creative principle of all things. It is how God made things come into being. He spoke and it came to be. Through the words written down by the sacred writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God has been making himself known to us in an intimate way. And again, the fullness of the way he revealed himself to us, that's found in Jesus, the person of Jesus himself, this attractive, wonderful Savior that calls us all to deeper knowledge in him. So, the scriptures are the word of God revealed to us in human language so that we might know God and enter into an intimate dialogue with him. An important question that comes in the minds of many people, who is the author of sacred scripture? The basic answer to that is God is the author of all sacred scripture, but he uses human authors to convey his word. And the beautiful thing here is that it's not, a, it's not dictation. God is using everything that's in the sacred writer, all his own abilities, his talents, everything in him and as we read in the prophet Jeremiah, even his own weaknesses, to convey God's message of salvation to his people. So though God is ultimately the author, guided by the Holy Spirit, the human author is important. And as we read scripture, 
it's important for us to understand that role of the human author. Above all things, the scriptures teach the truth. We open up the scriptures and we see many things. There are histories, there is um, astronomy, there are all sorts of different pieces of information. But when we open up the scriptures, we are looking not for those subject matters, but we're looking for the truth that leads to our salvation. And so the scriptures teach us the truth. They are without error and they are coherent. They lead us to the truth, ultimately, that is the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Word made flesh. We must do it according to the Church, according to the Holy Spirit. I know that I'm interpreting it according to the Holy Spirit when what I read and what I understand is according to the church. When I get out of the scriptures, not strange things, but things about the moral life, what my life will be like in heaven, and how Jesus Christ is my savior. When I see through a word called typology that the catechism talks about, I realize that Jesus Christ is present not only in the new, but in the old. He is the one who unifies. He is the one I must see in order to know that I am reading according to the Holy Spirit. Our faith teaches us, above all, that we are to understand the role of the human author in the sacred scriptures. The Catechism speaks about the fact that God inspires, the Holy Spirit inspires the human author to commit pen to paper, but he does so in a unique time and culture. He uses his own modes of speech and expression and feeling, everything that comes from who that human author is. God uses all of that. Also, too, um, the human author might use certain literary genre to convey meaning to us. That means that he will use different devices, maybe a poem, a song, or a lyric, a funeral poem sometimes, like an elegy, we call those, even a ballad. You'll find all sorts of different literary genres throughout the scripture, historical narrative even. All these different things come to play in how we understand what we're reading. We have to take all those things into account in order to get the fullness of the meaning that is to be conveyed in the scriptures. Also, too, we understand that we are to read the scriptures with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's always a good practice before we begin a reading of the sacred scripture to say a prayer, to ask the Holy Spirit for light so that we can understand in the light of the one who inspired that scripture, that those words might come to us uh, with the fullness of meaning. That way, our reading of the scripture takes on a dimension that is beyond the reading of any other type of text. You can read a cookbook and understand what it means and understand all the different uh, measurements, but at the same time, when you read the scriptures and you do so praying for the help of the Holy Spirit, it takes that reading from one dimension to the next. When we sit down to read the sacred scriptures, there really are three criteria that the church gives us. Um, one is to be attentive to the unity and the content of the whole of Scripture. Um, you know, I often uh, hear people, they just quote one verse, one chapter, one verse here, and use that for whatever meaning they intend in that moment. And uh, a lot of times I get confused. I can't call chapter and verse so easily. I tell people, I know how to get to the grocery store, but I don't know what its street address is. But at the same time, the scriptures have a unity and they have a, a wholeness. And if we read the scriptures, we have to understand that from Genesis to the book of Revelation, there is a unity there. And so if we're reading in one part, it's not alone. It never stands alone. It's part of the wholeness of this uh, revelation that God has given to us through his word. So we have to be attentive to that. 
we also want to read the Scripture within the living tradition of the Church. Nothing we do as Catholics should ever be isolated from the life of our Church. We're a communion. We're a community. We're the people of God. So we have to do so when we read the Scriptures in the living tradition of the Church. We carry that living tradition in God's Word um, as it's proclaimed in the Eucharistic Assembly, as it's used in all the rites and rituals of the Church, even in the liturgy of the hours, the prayers that priests and consecrated religious pray every day. We have to understand this Scripture in the living tradition of the Church. Um, we also, too, want to be attentive to what we refer to as the analogy of faith. This means that we look in the Scriptures for the coherence that's there, all the different teachings that lead us um, to salvation. There is a coherence there. Oftentimes we see things that we think are contradictory. Um, it's usually the case that if we find something we consider to be a contradiction, it's probably a lack of study or reason on our part, uh, not that there's a flaw in the Scriptures. So we're to, called to read the Scriptures according to how they help us understand the fullness of our faith that's been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. So our question is, what are the senses of Scripture? The most basic sense of Scripture is what we call the literal sense. This is the uh, sense of Scripture that everything else is built upon because we have to understand what's written on the page. If the Scriptures tell us that Elijah went to heaven in a chariot of fire, we have to understand who Elijah was, what a chariot is, and what fire is. That is an impressive piece of the Scriptures um, that describes the passing of Elijah. But we have to understand that literal meaning first. That's the base. But then also, too, there is the spiritual sense. This is the sense that takes us beyond the sense that takes us into a deeper understanding of what God is trying to accomplish in us through the reading of the Scripture. The spiritual sense of the Scripture has traditionally been divided uh, into um, three different um, ideas. One is the allegorical sense, which is the way in which we use a literary device, allegory, to help convey uh, an, a deeper meaning um, to the faith that we're receiving in the Scriptures. Um, we also, too, understand the Scriptures in a moral sense, how we can live justly and rightly in this life so that we can be with God in the next life. Then also, too, there is what is called the anagogical sense, and that's a, that's a big word. That's not a word we hear all the time. But that's the sense of Scripture that we read when we're trying to understand what God's Word is teaching us about the plan of salvation, our own salvation, how we can be um, with God in the kingdom of heaven. Our question is, what is the canon of Scripture? To be very basic, a canon is a list. Uh, the original word that, that is the root word there is kana, which in Hebrew was a little piece of reed that one used to measure something. It was a standard measurement, like a ruler. And so for the things that were written by people, uh, different writings that had a religious tone, uh, of which there were many, the Old Testament and the New Testament, people had the question, which of these writings represents the faith that we have received from God. So people in the community of believers, whether it be in the uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, or in the New Testament, uh, the Christian Scriptures and the Church, the community of believers applied a certain criteria, like a ruler, to those writings. Some writings did not represent the beliefs that the community had received from God. So they were not included on the list of scriptures that did represent what the community had received as a belief. As we mentioned earlier, you know, this tradition 
uh, handed down, things that have been handed down, it's interwoven in this process because the tradition that's received by God's people is part of the criteria that helps us to determine what are the books or what are the sacred scriptures that do represent what we believe. So these lists were created um, in the Jewish uh, people had their list of scriptures. We refer to that commonly as the Old Testament. And then the Christians too began to form a list of scriptures that represented what they truly believed. We see and hear so much in the news about the Gospel of Judas or different things, Gospel of Thomas, and it creates a flurry. But these writings have been around for a long time. Scholars have known about them. But they have never represented the faith that the Christian people have all held dear. The unity of faith and understanding those books don't really contain as the other books that we have in our New Testament do. So this is the canon, how it's formed. At the same time, we have now in the Old Testament 46 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament to make a total of 73 books that are considered part of the canon of Scripture in the Roman Catholic Church. Within the Scriptures, uh, there are different sort of groupings of books. Um, if we take the Old Testament to begin with, we have the first five books, which are the books of Moses, known as the Pentateuch or the Torah, the sacred Scriptures of the Jewish people until today. Then, uh, after those, we come to some historical books. There are books of wisdom in the um, Old Testament, and they can all be kind of described with um, a little phrase, Tanakh, T-A-N-A-K. The T are the, it's the Torah, the first five books of Moses. The N stands for Nebiim, or the books of the prophets, the Nebi being the prophet in Hebrew. And then the Ketubim, that's the K in that word Tanakh. And the Ketubim are the writings. These are uh, wisdom literature, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the Book of Wisdom, the Book of Sirach. All of these different things in the Old Testament come together to form the whole of the Old Testament. Our Lord says, when He gives His new commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He then says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what the hearer in Jesus' day would have understood when Jesus said the law and the prophets would have been the Torah and the books of the prophets, so the Old Testament. So our Lord was telling us how the Old Testament was a preparation for the gospel that he brought, the good news that he brought into the world. As we move into the New Testament, we see first the four gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of the four Gospels, three are similar to one another. We call those the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's Gospel is substantially different than the other three. It contains some things that the other three do not, uh, and it also has a little bit of a different style and a different tone. These four Gospels, though, um, contain the privileged record of what Jesus said and did. And so for that reason, they're held out in the Christian tradition in a special way. We proclaim the gospel solemnly in the Eucharist, uh, and the gospel book is carried in procession. These gospels, number four, uh, four has always been uh, an important number that indicates to us fullness and completeness because there are four directions on the compass, north, south, east, and west. And in that way, the Gospels cover everything. They are universal, and they contain for us the fullness of revelation about Jesus Christ. After the Gospels, we have one book that is kind of interesting, the Acts of the Apostles, also written by St. Luke, which tells us about the formation of the early church and the life of people in the time just after the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord. 
we have many letters from St. Paul, which are actually the earliest portions of the scripture. Uh, Paul and his uh, helpers committed these things to writing, these letters, so that other communities might understand the fullness of the Christian faith. Some of the letters in the New Testament are what we call Catholic epistles. You know, many of Paul's letters have a distinct uh, address. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. But some were written so that they might go out to all believers. We call those the Catholic epistles. Catholic in the sense of the word universal, so that um, the understanding of the Christian faith could be shared with all without reservation. Without the Old Testament, I don't see the many covenants by which God has revealed himself to the Jews, to me through the Jews, because the Jews were not made the promised people for themselves, they were made it for me. And I need to read the Old Testament and see what God did for Adam and Eve after the fall, for Noah after the flood, with Abraham, when he spoke to Abraham those many times, and Moses in the burning bush. Who wouldn't want to know that story? And I would lose that if I chucked out the Old Testament. Uh, I would miss the many other wonderful things, David and his many exploits. I would lose Isaiah and the burning coal on his lips. I would miss Jeremiah saying, God, you tricked me. But in the end, Jeremiah coming around and saying, God, you are, you are true and you are good. I, I need to read the Old Testament in order to see how God has prepared the human race through the Jews to welcome his son. Testament is the witness, eyewitness account of those apostles, those Christians, St. Paul included and James, who met our Savior in the flesh. They tell us about what he did and what he said, his words and his deeds. The church puts the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, in the primary place at Mass. The priest only gets to read that. The deacon only gets to read that. Why? To show us that these are the words of Christ. If we haven't caught it before, that get it now. These are the words of Christ. This is about the life of our Savior. Listen to what he, listen to what he has said. Look at his works and believe. The unity that exists between the Old and the New Testament is only found in Jesus Christ. If we do not see Jesus Christ clearly, we do not see the unity of the two Testaments. The sacred word of God, Jesus Christ, not a page, not a black and white word, but a person who is being spoken about from Genesis to Revelation. He is the one who unifies the scriptures, despite the many authors writing in many human words. He is the one who all the inspired writers were looking toward because he is the definitive revelation of God, of his eternal love for us, which our hearts need in this world. Uh, typology doesn't have to do with a typewriter. It has to do with what we see in the Old Testament prefiguring and foreshadowing what is to be revealed in the New Testament in Christ Jesus. The one that I think is really beautiful, the best example, the example that I like to use the most, is the question of the tree. In the Garden of Eden, there is a tree. Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of that tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, in a sense, from that tree, all sin and degradation comes into the world. Our Lord carries his cross to Calvary, and then his cross stands as another tree, a tree the fruit of which, when we eat it, brings all goodness and holiness into the world. That's the Eucharist. And so through our Lord Jesus Christ, all good things enter into our universe. When we look at the crucifix and we see the fruit of that tree, we see how God, from the moment of our first parent's sin, planned to bring us to the fullness of salvation. That's typology.
And we can go on and on and on with details in the Old Testament that point to things revealed in Christ in the New Testament. This is a beautiful thing, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb that was sacrificed so that the Israelites might be freed from slavery in Egypt and begin their journey with enough food and with enough strength and energy from consuming that protein, Christ too becomes the Lamb of God that's sacrificed so that we might have a spiritual food that gives us the strength to continue our journey to the promised land, which is the kingdom of heaven. We can go on and on, but this is typology. This is how God has prepared for us a way to understand and interpret what Christ did when he came. Uh, we want to talk about church institutional and individual. I am a member of the church. In my life, I need to be reading the scripture. I need to not just be listening to it at Mass, but take it home and think about what it says so that I might ask my priest the next time I see him or if I'm fortunate enough to have a nun in my parish to ask her what it means, to look up things in a commentary, and in particular to ask Christ himself before the Blessed Sacrament. There is great joy and consolation by learning that the scriptures can speak to you because they are the words of Christ and not merely the words of men. With regard to the institutional church, the church shows us the veneration she has for the scriptures because she elevates them during the Mass. Those scriptures are all through the Mass. The gospel is elevated as in a particular place with only the priest and the deacon speaking those words. The church shows me in her offices that she gives to her priests and her religious, strewn with scriptural phrases and allusions. Why? Because this is the language of the Holy Spirit in the words of men to tell us about Jesus Christ. And I must, I must, I must feed on these words. I must drink deeply in them. I must trust in the Holy Spirit. I must ask Christ to show me. And I must be patient. Like all good students, I must be patient. The scriptures are venerated uh, in the same way that Christ's body is venerated in our liturgy. It's carried in procession, it's incensed, it's used by the bishop, the gospel book is used to bless the assembly when the bishop celebrates a mass. So we have this reverence for the word in the same way that we reverence the body of Christ in the most blessed sacrament. Indeed, the two are just so intertwined in the way we celebrate the mass, the liturgy of the word, and then the liturgy of the Eucharist.
what is our response to divine revelation? Why does divine revelation call for faith as a response? Does this mean that our religion is a leap in the dark, an irrational response with no rational foundation? Uh, no, not at all. The church teaches, in fact, that reason precedes faith and prepares the way for it. And in fact, when, when we embrace faith, we come to Christ, whom the scriptures call the Logos. This is the eternal reason. We find the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of our rational nature, in no way in conflict. Uh, faith is necessary not because we reject reason, but because revelation promises something that is utterly beyond our natural capacities. Reason can tell us that God exists, but Christ promises what we could never attain by our own reason, that the eternal reason would become flesh and dwell within us. Faith is a supernatural state, a virtue infused into us by the power of God, a kind of shadowy foretaste of the life of heaven when we'll see God face to face. When an adult convert enters the Catholic Church, he makes a solemn pledge. He says, I believe everything that the Catholic Church declares to be revealed by God. How can he do this? How can he make this radical commitment, this total submission of intellect and will? Because that's what faith is. The Catechism defines faith as free assent to the whole truth revealed by God. And that revelation comes to us through the Church. He can only do this because he is persuaded that the Christian revelation is guaranteed by God and thus is more certain than all human knowledge or opinion. But because faith is also a sharing in divine reality, a foretaste of heaven, a supernatural state, uh, it can only come by God's grace, it can only be given by God. Reason can lead to and support faith. But that free act of totally submitting oneself to God and His church exceeds our natural capacity because it's a supernatural state and can only come to us through grace. question is, why is our faith both personal and ecclesial? I had the experience one time of being in a library at a Christian but non-Catholic university, and a young person approached me, I was dressed as a priest, I was using the library, and asked me if I was saved, if I had accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I replied that certainly I had, but that it was bigger than that that also, too, I was a member of a church, a community of believers who come together because they have uh, an assent to the faith that is in common. So, of course, our faith is personal. Christ means to touch us uh, as we are made uniquely in God's image and likeness. He sees and loves in us everything that we are. And then, we then, join ourselves to other people who have been touched in that same way by Jesus. And this is where we forge a church, a community of believers, a communion. And this is our life of faith. This church that we form, this ecclesia, which is the Greek word for assembly, it has a characteristic that is greater than the sum of its parts. This is our membership in the body of Christ. So as we are members of His body, we grow with His strength and with His power rather than individually isolated on our own. The image that's used so much for this, we call the church our mother, the mother who nurtures, the mother who gives us everything that we need to grow in wisdom and stature, much like our Lord grew in wisdom and stature during His hidden life in Nazareth, 
with Mary and Joseph in their home. My act of faith, your act of faith, must be intensely personal. It's the utterly free submission of my intellect and will to what God has revealed. But it's not faith in any old thing, completely subjective. No, faith is a response to divine revelation, objectively given and transmitted to us through the church. Thus, my intensely personal act of faith is one of submitting myself to realities that are outside of me, to an objectively given revelation transmitted by the church. Anything less than this would not be Catholic faith. It wouldn't even be rational, since I'd be setting up my own subjective experience as the ultimate criteria, and God offers no guarantee of truth to my subjective experience. Rather, Christ gave this promise to Peter, on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's why I can say with the convert, I believe everything that the Catholic Church declares to be revealed by God. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.